Hello, welcome to the second annual Billion Oyster Project Symposium. I'm Rubina Tellyabro, Director of Community Engagement. The symposium was created as a complement to our annual symposium, which is happening tomorrow on Governor's Island in person. The symposium is an opportunity for community and academic scientists, as well as undergraduate and graduate students to share their harbor and estuary themed research. This year, we will kick off our program with a panel discussion on the critical role of community and scientific research. We will then take a five minute break and come back to the second portion of our program consisting of research presentations. Um, I would like to thank all of you for being here. I would like to thank our panelists, our presenters, everyone behind the scenes and the and done a wonderful job. Um, so without further ado, let's begin our program. I would like to introduce our moderator for the panel discussion, Tanasia Swift. Tanasia is the field stations program manager for the Billion Oyster Project. She oversees 20 sites around New York City. She works with the community, making connections. She leads the development of field stations, planning events, recruiting schools, community organizations, and one training programs for our community partners. So Tanasia, take it away. Thanks so much, Rabina. And as Rabina mentioned, thank you all for joining us for our symposium this year. Um, so I'm excited to be the moderator for this year's symposium. So we have some awesome panelists, but before we go into that and I introduce them to you, um, just giving some background about what today's symposium and the panel is going to be about. So the critical role of community and scientific research, we hope to address the importance of community or citizen science. We currently work with over 100 schools and community groups across New York City. We're looking to highlight and expand the need for more community involvement. As we all know, natural disasters and burdens of pollution and environmental hazards are unevenly distributed within our society and marginalized communities bear the brunt of the environmental impact. The importance of community involvement within research would highly affect their community and paramount in working towards a more equitable and sustainable future. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask the panelists if they can just turn their uh, videos on. You don't have to turn your mics on just yet, but if you can just turn your videos on so everyone can see your faces, that'd be great, amazing, all right. So as we go through, we have, as I mentioned, four awesome panelists that I'm just gonna introduce themselves. And if they would like to add any more than they can. Uh, so we have starting with Dr. Liz Autern as an assistant professor of biology and the C California State University Monterey Bay and research associate at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Dr. Liz Alter research focuses on understanding how biodiversity is generated and maintained, particularly in oceans, estuaries, and rivers, using the tools of genomics. So come say Caesar, our next panelist is an indigenous artist, cultural consultant, and wampum carver. He is of Matinecock Turkey clan, Montauk, and Uncachuk descent. Born and raised in Queens, New York, the homeland of Matinecock, he works in the traditional medium and practice of wampum carving. He frequently collaborates with organizations to bring cultural programming to local tribes in their communities. As an advisor for the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus at the United Nations, he advocates for Indigenous American rights to member states, NGOs, and other Indigenous nations. A big part of his current community work has been working on cultural revitalization, preservation, and the repatriation of, sorry, repatriation of stolen ancestral and ancestors through grave protection for society. Tila Loretta Trog is a member of the Shinnecock Indian Nation and a member of the Hassanamisco Nipmunk tribe. She is fighting climate change through the indigenous women's group Shinnecock Kelp Farmers, an intergenerational collective of water and land protectors. 
She currently organized or currently organizes the Warriors and Sunrise Sovereignty Camp 2020 to raise awareness about the plight of the Shinnecock people. Tila graduated from Michigan State University College of Law with a Juris Doctor and Certification in Indigenous Law and Policy from the Indigenous Law Program. She has been fighting for tribal sovereignty for the past five years as an attorney of law offices of Tila L. Trog PLLC. And then last but not least, Rebecca Pryor serves as a, a dual role as executive director for Guardians of Flushing Bay and the New York City Civic and Community Stewardship Manager. In her role, Rebecca implements the Flushing Waterways Vision Plan, builds grassroots coalitions in pursuance of equitable waterfront and land use and manages community stewardship. In her role at Riverkeeper, Rebecca supports and sustains the organizational development and environmental advocacy of grassroots groups organizing for the health of their local waterways and watersheds. She has an MS in regional planning at Pratt Institute's Graduate Center for Planning and the Environment and has led environmental education and recreation programs with the Bronx River Alliance and the North Brooklyn Community Boathouse. So once again, thank you all for being here. And we're gonna jump right into the questions. So we do have a pretty tight agenda to get through. So for anyone who has questions for any of our panelists today, feel free to use the Q&A functions in your screens. Um, so we'll try to get to as many questions as we can after you know we get through some of the questions that I have for the panelists. And we'll try to, as I mentioned, get to them all. If not, we'll try to answer them directly through the chat. Okay, and without further ado, we're gonna start with our first question, which I'm gonna give to Rebecca. So Rebecca, what does community science look, look, look like, whether that's to you or in general, what does that look like? Yeah, thanks, Tanisha, and thank you for um, the introduction. It's appreciated. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, my understanding of community science is that it's basically a democratic approach to science. So we're connecting the scientists, the experts with the community members, also the experts, and kind of melding the two things together to make sure that the data that is being gathered is serving the agenda of folks really on the ground who are being impacted by the decisions that that data then informs. Um, so I think that can take a lot of different shapes. Uh, for Guardians of Flushing Bay, I'm thinking, you know, and, and throughout the watershed, there's so much water quality testing. I know that Billion Oyster Project is really taking on this um, amazing task of orchestrating the New York City water quality testing project now, and it's so fabulous. And that is like one example of managing a database that people can point to to say like, here are, here are the levels of enterococcus or fecal indicator bacteria, poop is another way to talk about it, in the water. Um, here's what it means, um, and then here's how we can advocate it, advocate for it. So that's one example is water quality testing. Uh, another example uh, that we use a lot in Flushing Waterways and I know is used across the city is using tools like iNaturalist where you can collect data about different ecology and different types of ecology and different, basically, yeah, different levels to show what the level of biodiversity is in a place. Um, and then compiling those in a database. Uh, I see similar things kind of happening with fish um, and working with local scientists who are monitoring what kinds of fish are in the water. I know that BOP does a lot of that work as well. Um, so it can take all these different forms, but I think the, the crux of it to me is about making sure that the process of data gathering and of science making and then of science making actually like informing policy is democratic and is like originating at the grassroots. Awesome. Would any of the other panelists, although a lot of the questions, I'm going to probably gear it to one person, but if there are any of the panelists who would like to add on to what Rebecca just said, feel free to unmute and add on. Otherwise, we can just go through the rest of the questions. Um, but I love, I love, you know, the answer that you gave and the fact that it is a, a democratic process. Um, so the next question I'm going to ask, I'm going to, you know, just ask, is there, are there any pros or cons to community science? So to come say, would you like to tackle that one? So some of the pros and cons to community science. Um, well, I think that 
Well, I guess I'll introduce myself in my language real quick. Queen will now need the Shinzi to come to the Ninon GIE Matawak Ni will ultimately win the play. Um, yeah, hello everyone. My name's Tecumseh. I come from the Matawak people. I'm Turkey Clan. Um, I think that there's, when we think about science, the problem becomes that there are the scientists who we see as being the professionals that know everything. And then there are the community members. And as an indigenous person, we know that a lot of things that we're taught and that we teach to us is facts, but it only then becomes facts to scientists when they've proven it in a study. And so that is kind of the, I think the cons when you think about who is the scientist and how do we how do we identify what is confirmed through a scientific theory versus, you know, for indigenous communities, I think a lot of us may not feel comfortable wearing the hat as being called a scientist. However, a lot of the knowledge that scientists are looking to get, we already know. And even I think the with the Billion Oyster Project, um, how the Billion Oyster Project uses uh, oysters, right, to clean water. We've been doing that for a very long time as indigenous people. In fact, we have a method of taking our clams and oyster shells and putting them in these mounds specifically uh, for spat and oysters to attach to. And that's the old practice that we have um, because we know that oysters and clams clean wa clean water. So there, I, I think, I don't know if that quite answers it, but I think that's some of like the pros and cons as far as through an indigenous lens is that often I don't know if indigenous people feel comfortable being, you know, thinking of themselves as scientists, but we do know that um, a lot of times we'll see something and it will be like proven fact, you know, by a scientist and it would be like, we've been saying this for a long time, but it was not accepted by a lot of groups because we were just community members or indigenous people instead of just being, you know, accepted because those are our traditions and oral traditions is how we record our history. And then I, I guess to quickly add on, do you, know if there's any ways of like bridging that gap. So when you talk about the more academic scientists um, and an indigenous scientists, if you will, um, do you have any recommendations or thoughts on how to bridge that gap or yeah, thoughts on ways that indigenous people can feel more comfortable having the hat of a scientist? Well, I mean, I think that, so there's something called pre-prime informed consent. And so that's a terminology that we use under the rights of indigenous people. And so currently I would connect it to some consultations that we've been doing about the wind turbines um, and its effect on nature. And I think that, you know, during these consultations, I think it's great that there's consultations happening, but there's that part of informed consent where I think scientists still need to really work hard to understand what does informed consent look like and putting forth the effort because a lot of times what I see when we're doing consultations with scientists is that we'll be telling them like, hey, in our practice, if, you know, um, if marine life are getting damaged because you want to, you know, do a study or a lay pipe or whatever, then that's unacceptable. And for them, it's like kind of like, well, this is a casualty that we we always know there's going to be somebody who's a casualty. Um, and for us, I was talking to uh, Rebecca earlier, and she, you know, she was reminding me of like the fact that you know, I think that there's it's not for us. You can't disconnect yourselves from the science. I mean, from the thing that you're studying. And so when you dis disconnect yourself from nature and you're studying nature, that's the problem. 
is because then you have no connection. I think that's that's where science needs to change is really don't think just because you're a quote scientist or a doctorate or something like that that you know better than the indigenous people who have literally been living on this land for like over 10,000 years. Um, I think until we accept the fact that community science and indigenous uh, teachings are just as relevant as um, people who have doctorate degrees, you know, and um, things that are acceptable may not be acceptable by us. And there has to be that consent from us, you know, and that respect by scientists. So that's how I like to see the shift. Amazing. And I think that's a great segue to our next question, which I'm going to pass on to Dr. Liz Alter. Um, so thinking about, you know, community science, how much community science research is actually used in academic science? Thanks, Tanisha. And um, yeah, I, I really um, had to think about this question and sort of turn it over in a couple of different ways. And I really appreciated um, the issues that Tecumseh just surfaced. Uh, and I think building off of those, when we think about how academic um, scientists you know, use uh, community data, so there's the, the use in terms of how those data are applied to you know, particular policy or management issues. Um, there's dissemination in scientific journals or conferences. Um, but I think what's, what's kind of missing in that framing is thinking about, again, that you know, building that bridge between academ academic scientists and uh, community members in terms of um, expanding our ways of knowing, right? Expanding how we think about data and how they're used in the first place and what, what data actually are, right? It doesn't have to be, um, you know, a, a longitudinal long-term uh, database to be valuable and useful. And um, I think one of the ways that community science projects can help to kind of make those bridges is by um, bringing scientists to a greater awareness uh, about those expanded ways of knowing that they can both use in, in, in you know, policy and management in their own work um, and, and trying to further our understanding of, of how natural systems work, um, but also in an educational context, right? In, in bringing, uh, bringing that message to our students that um, you know, we've, we've had this very constrained sort of uh, westernized notion of, of knowledge for a long time and that, that there's a, there's, we need to move, move beyond that. Um, so just to kind of build on that, the, you know, beyond uh, thinking about highly localized, so most, most community science projects do tend to be, uh, because their roots up, they're place-based, they're local, um, the, you know, many or most are, you know, the, the nature of that information is also going to be quite local. Uh, and so um, as a result, might not get disseminated uh, as broadly as, as we might wish. Um, one, one exception, and there are many exceptions actually to that, but one is um, something that Rebecca mentioned earlier, which is iNaturalist. Um, iNaturalist data gets used very, you know, very widely by academic scientists. And part of that is because the interface is so easy for users and it's easy for researchers um, to access those data. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, having a easy to use interface and having open science policies um, or practices where we uh, make sure that our data are shared widely, shared freely uh, in a format that is easy to access and that there is as much um, metadata as possible around that as well. So uh, as much you know, information about um, the, the day, time, temperature, all those, those, those little details that you tend to collect but might not necessarily put into your database uh, those are all uh, become extremely helpful when we're assembling these kind of global data sets uh, for understanding things like, you know, how species move in response to climate change. Um, so yeah, I'll end there. Thank you. Phenomenal. I, I love that you mentioned, you know, like a lot of community uh, science can be very localized, but community science can also have a very big impact depending on what you're using it for. 
Um, and so just to segue to our next question, and if there are other, once again, just wanting to open the floor up to any other panelists that would like to add on as we go through some of these questions. Um, I also just wanna make sure we have time to get through questions from the um, chat. So feel free to you know, chime in where you see fit. Um, but once again, moving on, uh, the next question I'm gonna direct to Tila. So I think I know the answer to this, but if you can elaborate. So were you involved in any community science projects that led to significant community impact or change in, in policy? Um, so yes, if you can elaborate on some, like some of the work that you do and how has your community science uh, impacted on a, a significant scale? So I'm a member of the Shinnecock Nation. We have had a lot of our land stolen from us and we're in a situation where we are on a small peninsula of land surrounded on all sides by water. It's about 800 acres. We're separated from the Atlantic Ocean by a barrier island and a bay. And we um, started to notice something peculiar. Our master wampum carvers like Tecumseh were starting to notice a deterioration in the clamshells that they were carving into wampum and beautiful jewelry. And we started to um, notice that the shellfish and the fish that we depended on to eat were starting to decline. And we were able to correlate it with a rapid rise in the overdevelopment um, in the area of land that was stolen from us um, and, and caused us to be put onto this small reservation. It's an area of about 4,000 acres called the Shinnecock Hills. It's extraordinarily sensitive ecologically. Um, it's the watershed for the Shinnecock Bay and the Baconic Bay. It's a very important bay for um, juvenile Kemp Ridley sea turtles. They love to raise their juveniles in that in the grasses. And so um, we found that we could grow sugar kelp, which is a seaweed and a very traditional to us. It's indigenous to this area um, and a natural resource that we have been able to sustain ourselves on for just hundreds of years, um, thousands of years really since the last ice age. And we were able to um, use the seaweed to sequester carbon and extract nitrogen from the bay and give um, marine life like shellfish and oysters and clams and horseshoe crabs and even shorebirds, we started noticing um, just this really um, widespread diversity level increase as we started planting and farming our seaweed in the bay. Um, but again, we had linked this to the overdevelopment. So we couldn't just limit our work to the water. We also um, made it you know, a desire and a goal to acquire land at the highest point of the watershed, which also happened to um, have our ancestral graves on. So we recently demolished a mansion that had about 15 bathrooms at the highest point of the watershed. Um, we were able to take that out. It's no longer putting nitrates into the water in our area. Um, since colonization, you know, 300, 400 years ago, there's never been a development of sewer systems. And so our water quality is just so bad, um, but it's been really incredible, the progress that we've been able to make. We just got the Shinnecock Bay designated as a hope spot. Um, so hopefully that helps our efforts to expand um, our work. And it is so important that when land and water access is returned to indigenous people who have been the stewards for you know at least 10,000 years the diversity of the ecosystem it just flourishes and um and that can be um accepted as fact now or proven by science in 10 years but it's truth and um it's just so important to return that land and water back to the indigenous care keepers and um you know basing uh, methods to mitigate the climate crisis in traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous people who have called, you know, the lands where you are home for a lot longer than you have. Yes, I love that. Are there any other um, issues within your community? You spoke about one particular issue, but are there any other issues that 
maybe that are pressing on in your community that you would like to research. And I would also like to present that question to any of the other panelists, but other topics or issues, you know, that maybe community science can help sort of like um, advocate for or help to spread word about? We're looking to um, just figure out the best way to remove excess nitrates from our water. And so, um, you know, any type of, I, I really find it fascinating that, you know, the children in educational settings are working on these exact things. You know, a science student can tell you exactly the mechanisms that these plants are using to sequester carbon or extract the nitrogen. And that's the kind of thing we need. We need kids connected to nature so that they can, um, you know, come up with these solutions based on what they've been exposed to. It can't be separate, you know, it needs to be people who really do have a passion who are out there and who, um, are connected in order to find those solutions that we're going to need going forward. Uh, yeah, do you mind if I also respond to this? Yeah, one? I was going to ask if, yes, any of the other panelists would like to add, you know, so yes, feel free. A couple things are coming up for me. One, um, just while we're still next to Tila's answer, I've been chatting with Teal and Tecumseh also about like the impact of um, wind turbines. Um, so I just, maybe I wanna open, I don't, I can just intro that for you too. Like, I feel like that's really your topic, um, but I feel like it's a nice time to kind of think about that impact as well. Do you want me to keep going or do you guys wanna take over? Or if Tecumseh, I don't know if you wanted to add in or, or add, you know, chime in here for free too. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, I think that's definitely a big issue. Um, and I think, you know, working with Rebecca's group that does a lot of community science, we've been able to really have a better understanding of what are the effects of wind turbines and like when we're being asked to consult on wind turbines, I think it's helpful when you have groups that come really in a good way, you know, um, and are willing to take the time to explain them. So, I think that that is a is a big issue. Um, finding renewable energy that doesn't displace um, animals is really important. Um, I'm a big fan of solar as well as composting. Um, but something that kind of connects to another thing, um, and that's connection to land. And me and Rebecca have been doing uh, work at the Queens Museum encouraging people really to think about their effects on nature and being cohabitors working towards stewardship. Um, so thinking about, you know, using reusable straws as well as uh, bringing your own plate, you know, or fork, knife and spoon, and just thinking about really like, how can we minimize our effects on nature, you know? And I think that is really kind of like in the heart of community science because it's giving the community the power, you know, to really change the different things that are having issues. And I think during the pandemic, we saw that as humans were staying inside, animals were coming back out, you know, and they were actually really thriving. So if we can work on thinking about how we as both individuals and institutions can minimize our impact on nature um, and not necessarily just focusing on money. Um, I think that is really important because if not, you know, the water, the same water that the animals aren't able to drink because it's polluted is also going to affect us. Yeah, thanks to Kamsa. And I also just want to add with the with the wind turbine, like that is something, you know, it's so tricky to figure out um, the impacts and really talk about the impacts of renewable energy. I feel like people are so, we're all really ready to move from fossil fuels, which is right, you know, and good and like figuring out then also the, the impacts of the renewable energy shift. Um, and so it, it has been really interesting um, talking with folks like to, um, Tila and Tecumseh about really thinking about the right whale, you know, and the right whale in um, in Long Island and the potential impact of 
wind turbines to that community and to the larger ecological community and really thinking it through like if we're going to build them what is a way that we can actually like minimize that impact as much as possible and how can we really be weighing both human communities and ecological communities so that has been um really eye-opening and, and enlightening for me um and and then the the research that's needed in order to be able to actually speak to that issue fully is also important. Um, and I also wanna name in terms of research needed, I'd say one of the biggest issues impacting um, communities around flushing waterways that I hear the most is really about the um, large scale development, um, like luxury market rate development and its intersection at the shoreline. Um, so it's impacts both to the ecological communities at the waterfront and then it's impact also to the low income communities and communities of color who really bear the brunt of these large scale development projects. So, um, you know, I think some of the things that we were doing with iNaturalist, um, there's a big project, Special Flushing Waterfront District, that was approved um, in 2020. And that project went forward without having to do a full environmental impact statement. So it meant that they weren't actually, they didn't have to look at all of the ecology in the area. They didn't have to look at its impact on it. They didn't have to look at the impact on the sewer system in full, you know, all of these different levels. So. One of the things that we did with iNaturalist was we wanted to document all of the um, ecology that we were seeing in this two acre woodland that's right there and this like multi acre wetland that's right there um, to really be like, this is what is actually going to be impacted. Here is what actually exists. So figuring out how can we use that research then? How can that research keep going forward in this way where we're actually fighting for both ecological health and human health at the same time. Um, and then I also wanted to name that um, we're talking a lot about like biology, um, but I think I don't wanna lose that social science is also so huge and has this whole um, critical piece around community science. So we do some work and are hoping to do some more work with the urban field station. Um, they do these social assessments for urban parks uh, and it's really getting people trained on the ground to document like value and meaning of not just parks but also like open spaces green spaces blue spaces um you know and and be able to document exactly why they're important and why they need to be protected awesome i think i you know i want to just quickly transition to a quick statement that i would like to share with everyone so in the national association of science writers article phd student deja perkins stated Volunteer data has race biases and with overrepresentation of wealthy white spaces and the underrepresentation of non white and non wealthy spaces. It really skews the picture of what we know about the landscape and where we think we should apply management and where we might implement policy decisions. So I would like to just present this question to basically anyone on the panel. Um, are there any biases that you can think of in the science community in regards to community science? I can take a, a first first stab. <laughs> um, so as uh, yeah, as we've been talking about, there there's. Um, there's often cases where scientists might not come in with a necessarily a great understanding of the community values and uh, stewardship values that are at the heart of um, what is, you know, what could be a community science um, program. And in fact, oftentimes scientists were not really trained uh, to think about values at all, right? Just the opposite in many cases. And so it takes a, a bit of kind of re-educating um, the scientific community about how to listen and engage uh, while, while being aware of the biases that uh, scientists might be coming in with. Um, and of course, we, you know, we know that white scientists are, are vastly uh, overrepresented in many parts of academia, and that um, leads to additional challenges, can lead to additional challenges when it comes to um, you know, local communities connecting with scientific community and that they're not, the community might not see themselves represented uh, or reflected in the research institutions that, that they might be partnering with. So working to broaden the diversity of, of scientists at um, universities and other research institutions is also a super crucial step.
that is a follow-up question is just, you know, how can we make community science research more accessible to marginalized communities? Any, yeah, advice or thoughts on that? Um, so seeing that Dr. Liz, you were already speaking on to, do you wanna add on to what you were just saying? Yeah, I think, I mean, so um, these are long standing issues, but um, early, you know, building trust and collaborations over, over the long term. I think is, is really um, crucial. And that's aided by when scientists are bringing a sense of um, commitment to the place, commitment in terms of the values. Um, researchers need to make sure that they're coming in with a, a good understanding of what's most important to the community and not just coming in with assumptions about that. Um, that way everybody is on the same page with regard to the objectives of the project. Um, and you know we, we know from um, COVID, our COVID experience now that we can't just kind of science our way to solutions uh, a lot of the time, right? We need to, um, we need community buy-in and that is a long-term process. Uh, it can't, can't be just kind of done overnight, um, can't parachute in and, and, um, and just uh, expect that everybody is going <laughs> to jump on board. Um, so yeah, we need to think carefully about how outreach is occurring over, over the long term. This is, would be my, my message. I think it's always important to be cognizant of the root of the scientific fields in general. And, um, you know, at, at the heart of it, and especially in the early 1900s, 1930s, when a lot of the policies of this country were being created, um, the scientists at that time were um, very racist and um, had a lot of policies towards genocide of indigenous people. And um, those, those scientists impact are still part of the laws that govern the jurisdiction of our everyday lives. And so we have to be cognizant of that. Of that. And when we um, kind of shift the power um, by funding community science efforts and, uh, you know, putting money towards the problems where they are with the people who are best suited to come up with solutions for those problems, I think that we can start to um, see that community buy-in um, and really, um, really actually meaningfully help those who are most impacted at no fault of their own um, by, by the crisis that we're in. And so it's really, it's really just important to, um, to be cognizant of that, that, um, you know, sometimes the, the community does have more answers than a group that historically has excluded those voices completely from, um, from the narrative. Yeah, just to quickly add to that, I mean, I think Taylor took the words right out of my mouth, probably because we work together so much, uh, we think alike. But no, I think that, um, I think creating more opportunities in the communities that, you know, are affected is really important, but also haven't really had the opportunity because I think, unfortunately, a lot of marginalized communities are taught that they need to leave their community to be able to make a difference. And so I think more creating more opportunities, you know, I know the Billion Oysters Project has a huge reach, um, but we, and I, you know, I really like the work that they do. Um, and I think that just creating more opportunities where we're bringing these options into communities, but we're also creating opportunities that are funded in these communities to do the research is really important. And, you know, helping those communities and those community scientists get to the same levels as other scientists. So meeting them where they're at and then trying to help them change versus telling them, okay, you have to leave your community, you know, to go somewhere else. Well, why can't, you know, why aren't we making more opportunities that is funded too? And I think the funding is also a big thing because often, you know, people will come to different communities, whether it's science or different initiatives and they'll offer internships that are unpaid. And if these, you know, same marginalized communities are trying to figure out, well, 
you know, am I going to be able to feed my family or, you know, help my parents out or whatever the situation is, you know, we need to really meet people where they're at and, and encourage more institutions. And also, I think there are so many people who, who are doing these things. Um, I would love for to see those people who are doing those things be able to specifically fund for them to bring those things back to their communities um, if they have left their communities and if they haven't left their communities. Um, you know, if we give kids options to do things in their communities, then that's going to be what they gravitate towards. So I would like to see really a policy and funding change and really like a shift of the, the mindset that you have to leave in order to um, reach kind of a certain level. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. Rebecca. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, funding was really coming up for me as well. Um, and I think just to, you know, uh, when when we're talking about sorry, when we're talking about historically marginalized communities, like, um, you know, what we're often talking about in the United States is like race and, and class, race and income. Um, and those two things are like really interconnected, right? But just to separate them for a moment, like, I think the comment that I'm seeing in the chat around um, there being like a large rise of Latinx um, scientists, I think is proving like, it's not lack of interest, right? It's not lack of like understanding and desire to, to be connected to our environment, to improve our environment. So like, it's not, I don't think it's lack of any of those, but I think then looking at the income piece of it and where those two pieces can be, get interconnected, like, I think, you know, it's so important to, if, if you are a scientist who has, who's doing research and there's a component that involves community science or like some sort of volunteer aspects, like, write in a stipend, you know, like that's so critical. Um, also think about, you know, these questions of like, where are you pulling your community scientists from? You know, where are you doing your research? Where are you focusing on advocacy? Like those are really great questions. And then for the community scientists on the ground, um, we're then building out these, you know, agenda, not agendas, sorry, sorry, building out these like research projects, you know, thinking through, you know, those same questions. Who are we reaching out to? How are we reaching out to them? Do we have stipends written in? Maybe we're doing a, you're writing a grant for a research study. Like, is there a portion in there that's written in um, for community scientists on the ground? So anyway, just funding feels so critical. Yeah, I think we have about, so five more minutes. I just want to say, even as a moderator, I am taking in these gems and like writing down notes as we speak. Uh, so thank you all. This is phenomenal. Um, so I do want to have an opportunity for the audience. I know there was a few questions that came in while we were talking. talking. Um, so I want to get to some of those. Um, once again, we might not get to them all, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, so the first question in the chat that we had uh, is addressed to everyone. So should science serve an agenda or is science independent? So if anyone wants to try to tackle that one, um, that was sorry, that was in a response to the thing I said at the beginning around um, uh, community scientists and democratic, uh, it being a democratic process, and then that democratic process then can fuel, I think I said, whatever agenda they might have. So just to, to respond to that, you know, I think just trying to say any topic, you're going to have some sort of curiosity at the kernel of that topic, right? Like some sort of thing you want to answer for your community, for yourself, for humanity. Um, and then you're going to like approach it as such. Um, and so that question could come from the academic scientists. That question could come from community scientists. Um, but all of that is an agenda in that way, because it's a question you're trying to answer. So I can see how agenda might not be exactly the right point there. Um, but then I'd also challenge that like, isn't, you know, like just track whatever research, whether it's community science research or academic science research, how it's being funded and who it's being funded by. Those funders have agendas, you know, and what are they? So um, I think it's pretty hard to say that things are totally independent. 
And then uh, uh, Tila, we have a question for you. I believe as you were talking about kelp. Uh, so why is kelp illegal in New York State, but not in Maine or Connecticut? So Maine and Connecticut it's really have thriving um, seaweed industries. It's really unfortunate yeah. that New York is caught behind this bureaucratic red tape. Like um, recently, <laughs> if everyone can mute themselves, that would be great. Uh, recently, Governor Hochul had signed some legislation authorizing the commercial cultivation of sugar cow, but it's limited geographically to Gardner's Bay and Peconic Bay. Um, there are some other folks cu cultivating kelp on Long Island, but they're all currently under research permits with um, either Stony Brook University or Cornell University. Um, and so what we're doing with the Shinnecock kelp farmers is we are um, looking to um, help those who are right now stuck behind that bureaucratic red tape by developing our technology to make as many seedlings as possible um, so that when um, in New York State figures itself out and gets out of its own way with the with the seaweed cultivation. Um, we'll have the seedlings ready for those aquaculture specialists who want to get in the water and, and start going because we need to do this at a wide scale level that is going to take a lot of participants It's going to take a lot of community members um, and we need our lawmakers to really um, help us, uh, you know, find those thriving industries that we see in Connecticut and Maine and all along the West um, Coast as well. Amazing. And then uh, we have about just two minutes left before we go into break. Uh, but the last question that I, you know, want to address from the audience is what would you recommend for someone who wants to pivot their career to work for these sorts of issues. Beyond volunteering, what pathways have you seen folks take to make ecology the center of their career focus? I think it's really just about getting involved. I, I'm an attorney, but um, you know, I'm still out there in the water making a difference. And it's getting to know what the issues in your community are. What are those issues that um, BIPOC people are facing? I'm sure that someone has a project somewhere um, that could use your help. And it's really just about like what drives you and what your passion is and what difference you want to make in the world. You don't need to have a formal science degree to, to get involved and to make a difference. And so it's really about reaching out, going to different organizations, meeting people and networking and, and doing that um, hard work of relationship building. And, and, and I think you'll find your, your way there. I love Amazing. That. You're here. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as we approach so the break, um, panelists, I want to thank you again for joining us. Um, for anyone who would like to get in contact either with your, you or your organization to be involved, feel free to put that in the chat if you have a website or resources that you would like to share. Otherwise, I want to leave the last minute. If there are any last minute words or gems that you would like to share, we can do that now. And then we're going to go into a five minute break. So yes, any resources, websites that you would like to put in a chat, you can do that. Or if you want to say anything to round us off, feel free to, um, you know, add that on. Yeah, I, I just want to say, like, I often encourage people when I'm working with Rebecca is, um, is really to take hold of, you know, if you want to see a change, don't just wait for somebody else to do it, you know, and especially with don't get overwhelmed with things that you can't, that you don't have the ability to change by yourself, but evaluate if you want to see a change, what are the things that you do have the ability to take care of, you know, and like I said earlier, I love composting, it's something that everybody can do. I've, it's annoying when the closest compost might be like two miles away from you. I've walked two or three miles just to compost, um, but it's, it's because I made time for it, you know? And I, you know, I carry around a wooden fork, knife and spoon whenever I go places. So I'm not 
using um, you know plastic things. I have a a box of straws made out of straw in my car for when I'm driving and I need a, an iced coffee, you know, there's things that all of us can do. Um, but it's really about kind of taking time to slow down, which I know is very hard for us and evaluate what cha type of change do you want to see? And then actually taking the steps to see what type of change you can do, you know, to make that change as well as, you know, that's encouraging other people because when they see you doing things, they'll be like, oh, what are you doing, you know? And then they'll also do it, especially um, with kids and people who are really, you know, kind of in that same mindset about wanting to make that change. Phenomenal. Well, once again, thank you all for joining us. I think we're going to get right into the break. Panelists, feel free to continue on and stay on the call to see our next presenters. Um, so everyone who is joining, we're going to take a couple minutes break so you can hop back on at 6.54, so two minutes. Um, we'll see you all soon. All right. Thanks, everyone.